I want to talk about getting back to normal. When are we going to get back to normal? Normal. Back to normal. Get back to normal. The hope of the establishment is that when the crisis is over, we return to our old normality. No, this is not possible. Normal is what got us to this critical point. Going back to normal is getting back on a train speeding towards a brick wall. It is now clear that what did the most damage was not the virus itself, but rather the choice not to take it seriously. Instead of an immediate lockdown, we hesitated because we were afraid of stopping the economy. But this fear is due to the fact that our economy was never designed for our collective well-being. And it's time for change. Ideally, during a pause of consumption like a pandemic, non-essential activities should stop while the essential activities should support everyone else. A good portion of the population wouldn't work, but nonetheless, everyone would have access to essential goods. A human community could set itself that set of rules and that set of objectives. Let's concentrate on making do with what we have. But there is a problem. We currently have a capitalist system that is built on economic growth. A system that is built on endless growth is not capable of reducing consumption. I cannot imagine capitalism surviving the way it works now. The coronavirus crisis is just a dress rehearsal for the forthcoming global warming ecological crisis. During a pandemic, essential businesses gouge prices. Dairy farmers being forced to dump excess milk because restaurants and schools that would usually buy it are shut down. Abundance of a product means lower prices. So farmers dump the extra milk to keep prices high instead of giving it away where needed. There's got to be some way to connect the dots between the hungry people who need to eat and the farmers who have the surplus. And non-essential businesses go into debt because they lose their income while still having to pay rent and other expenses. And because someone else relies on them paying those expenses, the debt spreads around. Now the financial stress for many is through the roof. 60 million people have filed for unemployment insurance. We as a country are going to be borrowing a lot. The worst recession in 300 years. Too many businesses can hang on no longer. And they've decided their employees have to go. So the fear of stopping the economy has two sides. On the one hand, we individuals are afraid because we have no guarantee that we will make it to the end of the month. Without work, we can't pay rent, mortgage or other expenses. On the other hand, there are the owners. During a lockdown, companies go into debt and are crushed by competition from countries that didn't have a lockdown or have made a shorter one. This is because a country that lets the virus spread but doesn't stop the economy seemingly becomes more competitive. And it's here that the government comes into play. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Since the spread of neoliberalism with Reagan and Thatcher in the 1980s, we tend to imagine the ideal government as an absent one. The argument of the rich and the corporations was, we're taxed too much, you must give us more profitability, lower our taxes, and then we will have a more healthy economy. But actually, the functions of the government have never disappeared. They have simply been transformed. Gradually, politicians have become managers, and the state has become a technocracy. Therefore, it's not the regulation that drives the government away, but it's the government itself that imposes and protects the regulation. It's always the government that ensures greater autonomy to the banks and allows them to give reckless loans. In this worldview, 
The owners are seen as the engine of the economy. So far as poverty is concerned, there has never in history been a more effective machine for eliminating poverty than the free enterprise system and the free market. So during a lockdown, the managers make sure to keep the owners alive. Trillion dollar stimulus to rescue the economy. A coronavirus emergency fund. Unprecedented 750 billion euro coronavirus recovery fund. And despite bailouts aren't really a free market idea, they are considered necessary to protect the economy from monopolies and sell-offs to foreign buyers. So the government borrows from the European Union or the International Monetary Fund. But where does the government get the money to repay the debt? It gets it from us. More specifically, it makes cuts to welfare. Welfare is a compromise that workers have earned through their struggles. Government-sponsored programs for housing and health, for social security and education. But in order to send subsidies to companies, the government makes cuts to welfare. And paradoxically, what used to be corporate debt suddenly becomes public debt. A prosperity won't come by inventing more and more lavish public expenditure programs. The exact same process has happened during every past economic crisis, like in 2008. We have already had a redistribution of income and wealth. It went from the poor and the working class and the middle all the way to the top. As a result of this process, our health services have been devastated over the years. We found ourselves facing the pandemic with a shortage of intensive care, while private hospitals and pharmaceutical companies made millions by privatizing their right to life. And when doctors protest, it's always the government that sends the police to repress them. I would like to express this evening my deepest gratitude unto these people, these heroes in white lab coats. When there is a difficult situation, war and so on, the ruling class and the rich are always ready to adopt this language of, you know, uh, we are now in the same boat, solidarity and so on and so on. These are tough times, but you don't have to go through them alone. Act fast and aggressively and look out for one another that if we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. It's clear that the economy was never meant for us. The owners, by paying us as little as possible for the work we do for them, have absorbed an enormous amount of wealth from the production system. But if we try to regain this wealth with taxes, many owners will flee to foreign markets and the so-called engine of the economy will go away with them. It's just economics. People don't work to pay taxes. The rich people are going to leave. Whether they live here or live in a place like Switzerland, doesn't really matter to them. The government could nationalize the bankrupt companies. However, nationalization is often fought back because it's considered inefficient. There would be no competition between private individuals and everything would be slower. And a country that is labeled inefficient receives no foreign investment. In a sense, we are all being held hostage, waiting for the capitalists to decide whether and when and how it's profitable enough to meet the social needs. The result is that we are trapped into giving subsidies to the owners. We are afraid of mistreating them even though it's because of them that we live in misery. What is possible or what is impossible today is ideologically overdetermined. It's possible Neuralink, uh, travel to other planets, that's possible. But to raise taxes, to give 5% more money to healthcare, no, that's impossible and so on. You know, these are the, in this sense, we should do the impossible. People are afraid of lockdowns because they know that they always end with a transfer of wealth. 
People need guarantees in order to feel safe. Housing, healthcare, and education shouldn't be just services, they should be rights. In order to achieve this, our production system should not be a tool for private profit, but rather a tool for the common good. If that happens in enough countries, it will become a global movement, and that's my hope for what we'll see in the years ahead. One of the most dangerous ideological motives is that today it's a state of emergency, it's not the time for politics. No, it's maybe the most political moment of our lives. Now our future is decided. Now it's the time for politicization.